Sorry. <laughs> you, made, you made a way. You made a way. Good morning, good morning, guys. How you doing? <laughs> All right, good morning, everyone. Let's find a seat and we'll get started this morning. Sorry for being late. But, uh... Huh? Forgive my tardiness. <laughs> Serious consequences. Otherwise. Serious. All right, good morning, everyone. Let's, uh, has everyone got a set of notes? Who would like a set of notes? Uh, you might not want a set of notes, but uh, Cameron's got a set of notes if you want a set. All right, let's open the service in a word of prayer, shall we? And we'll get into the lesson this morning. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you for your goodness and blessing to us. Lord, as we continue through the book of Revelation, which is an amazing book, uh, but certainly needs your direction and uh, it needs you to open the eyes of our understanding and we ask that for today. We pray that you'll lead us and guide us into all truth and uh, God, we pray that you'll be exalted and magnified, not just in the Bible class, but in the service to come in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's go to Revelation chapter 11, Revelation 11. We won't be in Revelation probably next week. Um, because we're moving. <laughs> so I've got a, just a very simple Bible class lesson for next week. Uh, so we'll pick up Revelation the following week when we get to chapter 12. So we'll finish here. We're going to deal with Revelation chapter 11, which predominantly is dealing with the two witnesses. Uh, I also put in the notes that what we could say for a title for this chapter is from the middle to the millennium. All right, from the middle to the millennium, because when you look at Revelation chapter 11, it starts out with these, uh, with these two witnesses who begin their ministry at the halfway point of Daniel's 70th week, and it finishes in chapter 11 with all of the nations of the world coming under the rule and reign of Jesus Christ. Well, when does that happen? That happens at the millennium, right? So chapter 11, we finish with the millennium, and then when you get to chapter 12 onwards, it goes back to the beginning and follows on through, but with uh, some added stuff in there, some uh, other descriptions in there as well. And so we're going to look at this, uh, this final, I guess, three and a half years from chapter 11. If we look at it in verse number one, it says, There was given me a reed like unto a rod, and the angel stood saying, Rise and measure the temple of God. And the altar and them that worship therein. But the court which is without the temple leave out and measure it not. For it is given unto the Gentiles and the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. Well, how long is forty and two months? Now, remember the Jewish calendar doesn't have 31 days in it. 30 days in each, uh, in each month for the Jewish calendar. So it, 42 months is three and a half years. All right. Sorry. That's right. Oh. Go to the top of the class. <laughs> Love it. Thank you. Um, so yeah, so we're talking about three and a half years here. Now, some have suggested that there is no physical temple that's going to be built. Uh, and they use, for example, the fact that in the New Testament, the, the temple is our body. Our body is the temple of the Lord. Uh, I personally believe that there's going to be a temple built. Um, because it says right here in chapter 11 that to measure the temple, you can't measure something that's not there. Uh, I mean, you could measure me if you want. Not that matter of fact, I could tell you I'm 5 foot 11 and shrinking. You, sh you shrink when you get older. Uh, but I don't believe it's talking about this temple. The, the te I understand the New Testament. When you get saved, the Spirit of God comes in and we are now the temple of the Lord. I get that. But I also believe that later on because... The Antichrist is going to set himself up in that temple. So if we go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 2, oh sorry, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, we'll see that he sets himself up there because he's he's now he wants to be worshipped, but don't forget behind him is the dragon or Satan. Now Satan has always wanted to be worshipped, has he not? I mean we go back into the Old Testament, Isaiah 14, I think it's Ezekiel 28, I think it is where you see the desire of, of Lucifer, I would say probably seeing everything that God was receiving, the worship and all of that, and he's like, wow, I want that. I want that. So Satan has always wanted the worship of man. 
He's wanted all of that. He's wanted the top job. So now he is behind and he's empowering the Antichrist who also wants to be worshipped. Now let's have a look at it in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together under him. Anyone here disagree that that's talking about the rapture? No, that's the rapture, right? Our gather, his coming and our gathering together unto him. That you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ, that's the rapture, is at hand. So everyone who's going around saying, well, you know, it's uh, the rapture's going to be soon or the rapture's going to be this and you know, so much still going on about red heifers and all this sort of stuff that's going on. Um, I, I don't have a time frame or a date or anything like that. I'm not allowed to set dates. But I don't see it any time soon. I think there's a length of time that we've got where we're going to see some things take place. All right? So for us, now isn't it interesting that, and I, and I don't say this unkindly, but those who, as we said last week, who would say or believe and preach in the imminency of Christ, meaning nothing else needs to take place Jesus could come back at any moment. What you notice is that it's that group that obvious, uh, ominously come out with saying, oh, you know, Jesus is coming at any time. You've got to watch this. And, and they look at all these signs that are going on out there and anything to do with Israel that's how, oh, Jesus is coming back soon. Well, there's, I believe, according to the scripture, there's a number of things that are going to take place before Jesus comes back. Now, we're looking for his return. We're expecting his return. We're, we're definitely hoping for that as far as a biblical terminology is concerned. But he says this in verse 3, Let no man deceive you by any means. There's a lot of, listen, there's a lot of good preaching on YouTube, but there's a lot of bad stuff. All right? Please be discerning what you watch on YouTube. I'm not saying don't watch anything. Like I said, there's a lot of good guys out. And by the way, let me just say this, and, and I've been an independent Baptist since I was saved, raised in a Baptist church, trained in a Baptist, all that sort of stuff. There's some good stuff out there that are non-Baptist preaching as well. Now, you can hang me, you can shoot me or do whatever. It doesn't bother me. I've watched enough and read enough to know that independent, fundamental, Bible-believing Baptist people don't have a... Uh, a monopoly on the truth. Right? Is everyone okay with that? <laughs> like, you know, sometimes we think that, you know, Baptists are going to be the only ones in heaven. Well, here's a news flash. That's not the case. Okay? But anyway, so let no man deceive you by any means. For that day, which is the day of Christ, the rapture, shall not come except there come a falling away first. So there's the first thing, isn't it? The falling away, the, uh, the, the, the going into apostasy. Now, who would agree that we see, we see apostasy today, don't we? But there's going to be a greater falling away. Now, I personally believe this. I don't think the world can go apostate because they're already apostate, if you please. Apostasy affects those that once held to the truth, but then depart from the truth. And I don't believe you can lose your salvation either. But you've got people that once held and fought for the truth, like Jude says, earnestly contending for the faith, that when things get hot, they're just going to say, oh, I'm just not, you know, they're going to back off or whatever. Now, you can sit and judge and say, oh, well, they're not saved. Well, listen, God's the judge. The Lord's the judge. He's the one who says who is and who isn't saved. It's not for us to go around and say, oh, well, bless God, pastor such and such shouldn't have fallen. It means he wasn't saved. No, that's not the case at all. Got to judge, we've got to look at things correctly if we want to do things like that. We've got to be so careful. But the falling away is going to affect believers. And there's going to be a remnant that's just going to hold to the truth and fight for the truth. But there's going to be consequences for us in doing that. Anyone heard about the new bill that wants to be passed in America at the moment? Anyone read about that as far as discrimination and uh, you can't say anything negative against the Jewish nation. You can't say that, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, in there, I think, if, correct me if I'm wrong, you can't say that they killed Jesus. Yeah, that's right. You know what, i tell you what we'll be, what we'll be uh, persecuted for right here. Because what does the Bible say? It's all through the scripture that they persecuted and killed. As a matter of fact, I'm reading through Acts again at the moment and straight off the bat, 
the preaching that Peter was preaching, saying, you guys killed Jesus. Well, that's going to be, apparently that's going to be done away with if this bill gets through. And so therefore what we're going to see is that we're going to see, remember, remember John was persecuted for the kingdom of God and for the word, right? Well, listen, I, I love my King James Bible. I'm a King James Bible guy and I love the King James because it's an every word book. It doesn't have anything missing out of it. And I believe, this is just me, I don't know what you, I believe personally that this book will be what we're persecuted over. Because a lot of the modern versions today have watered down everything. They're going to be okay with it. Oh, you're preaching out of the NASB or the LSB or the whatever it is that's out there. But you say, no, I have the King James Bible. And according to my Bible, the Jewish race killed Jesus Christ. Well, you know what's going to happen to you and I if we're going to, if we're going to stand up for our faith? We'll either get locked up or we'll go have a holiday at that place up at Toowoomba that they built. <laughs> Join me. We'll have a we'll have a uh, we'll have a captive audience. <laughs> I mean, they build it for something, right? They build it for something, and they're obviously not doing a good job with holding all these uh, detainees or whatever it is. They let them go and commit havoc out in the community. But you know what? Ah, oh, let's put Christians in there. That's a good idea. Let's put them in there and let's treat them badly. Anyway, how did I get onto that? It's all good anyway. Look at verse 3 again. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first. That's right. So they're going to be people say, oh, it's too hard for me. I'm not, I'm not going to worry, worry about that. And that the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. So that means you're going to be here for the Yes. You knew that anyway. No, no. Stop. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's exactly right. Those that hold to a pre-tribulational view, they're not here for that, apparently. Uh, they're going to be shocked, I think. They're going to be shocked. But they're not knowing some of them, they'll probably say, oh, no, that can't be right. We're still, no, 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 we're still going before the seven years. That can't be the Antichrist. Even if he gets up and says, I am the Antichrist, there'll be still some who will say, no, that's not right. It's not true. But yes, Duncan, we will be here. We will be here. Thank you. Well, you've... <laughs> Did you read your Bible before coming to church this morning? Okay. The <laughs> NIB. Oh. Look at verse 4. Now look at this. Who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called his God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Now let me say something about that. That is an abomination as well. That is an abomination. And so therefore, here he is, here he is, he's putting himself out there, he's, he's, I don't know how you view it, you know, it's like, he wins over the hearts, is why I believe the Antichrist has got both, I believe this, I believe he's got both Jewish blood and uh, Islamic blood or Muslim blood, you know, I think he's a half and half, because, I see that, because he, he just makes friends with both sides, Okay, he makes friends with both sides and then, and then lo and behold, he's just going to stop the sacrifices that are going on, put himself up there. That's why when the mark of the beast comes out, it's not just receiving a mark, but it's a worship as well. You look at Revelation 13. Now, it also says this, that those of us whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life will not worship. So that tells me also, Duncan, that we'll be here at that time, Right? Those who are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. So he's going to sit there in the temple. He's going to show himself that he is God and he wants to be worshipped. And I know it goes on, but we're not looking all at it at 2 Thessalonians. But just to say that, that the temple is going to be built and he's going to set himself up in there to be worshipped. That's what he wants. If you don't worship him, again, you go back to Daniel. Remember Nebuchadnezzar wanted to be worshipped and so on all through uh, uh, Bible history, you see men wanting to be worshipped. Antichrist is no different. What happened to Daniel and the crowd that didn't want to worship? They got thrown into the uh, fiery furnace. Was Jesus with them in the fiery furnace? So you go through the fires of affliction. Who's going to be with you when you go through the fires of affliction? The Lord Jesus Christ is going to be with you. All right, so let's go back to Revelation chapter 11. So we see here that the, the court or this temple is going to be measured. And verse 2 says, The court which is without the temple leave out and measure it not, for it is, it is given unto the Gentiles and the holy city, which is what? Who is the holy city? It's, uh, who? Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Sorry, yes. Jerusalem is the holy city. 
right? And that's going to be trodden underfoot 40 and two months. So again, another three years, you take the beginning, the middle part of the, three, of the seven years, and for the next 42 months, there's going to be Gentiles that are treading underfoot the holy city. Now, let's have a look at a few scriptures here dealing with that. Let's go to Luke chapter 21. Luke chapter 21. Look at verse 22. He says, For these be the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. But woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days. For there shall be great distress in the land, and wrath upon this people. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword, and shall be led away captives into all nations. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Now, the times of the Gentiles is a very interesting phrase. Okay? We're not going to get into it this morning, but if you were to study out Ephraim, if you were to go back into the Old Testament, Ephraim was the, uh, if you please, the, the head of the Gentile nations. Okay, so we, anyway, we won't get into that. Probably shouldn't even say it because we all what? Anyway, we'll look at it. We'll look at it at another time. But if you notice what he says here, the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled, which means this: that there is going to come a time, I believe, where. All of those who are going to be saved have been saved. Have been saved. And so therefore, once that's done, we get taken out, the rapture, now, and then everything else falls into place. But till the times of the Gentiles. So the, the Jerusalem is going to be trodden down of the Gentiles for three and a half years. Let's have another look at another scripture. Let's go to Matthew. I've got Matthew 23, but I think it's probably Matthew 24. Oh, no, go to Matthew 23. Let's read a few scriptures here. Look at verse 34. Wherefore, behold, I send unto you prophets and wise men and scribes, and some of them you shall kill and crucify, and some of them shall you scourge in your synagogues and persecute them from city to city. That upon you, that upon you may come all the righteous blood. Now watch this. I mean, this is stuff that's going to, we're going to be persecuted for if we're going to preach this. That upon you, that's the Jewish people, right, may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth from the blood of righteous Abel unto the blood of Zacharias, the son of Berechias, whom he slew between the temple and the altar. Verily I say unto you, all these things shall come upon this generation. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I... Have gathered thee, oh, sorry, gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. For I say unto you, ye shall not see me henceforth till you shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. So the house is going to be left desolate. Jerusalem. Now let me let me just skip ahead right now. I believe the great whore of Babylon is Jerusalem. Okay? When we get there, we'll have a look at that. But the very fact that when you look at Revelation 17 and 18, I don't believe it's America. All Americans want it to be America. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Americans just got to be in there. I'm sorry because I have a few friends that watch from America. You're not there, all right? Just, you know, oh, yeah, we're there. No, 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 you're not there. All right. So it's like, no, it's not Jerusalem. It's not New York. The great whore... Is, is Jerusalem itself because she hoard herself out to other nations and peoples and she killed a number of different prophets and apostles and stuff like that. She was drunk with the blood of all these people. And this is exactly what Jesus is saying here about them. Now, the gospel came to them, did it not? The, the Lord wants them saved, just like I hope we want them saved, but they don't get a free pass. They don't, they don't get this, oh, look, here he is, Jesus is coming, oh, now I believe. No, that's, no, that's not, that's seeing, is, that's not by faith. 
Now what did Jesus now what did Jesus say to the rich man that was in hell being tormented? What did he say? Oh, send me back. I've got brethren. And Jesus said this, no, 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 no. They have to hear the prophets. So in other words, every Sabbath day that the scriptures were read, whether it's Isaiah, whoever, they had to believe through the scriptures of the prophets. It's not like, oh, if I see it, I'll believe it. No, 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 no. The gospel is for them now. It's for, listen, it's for the Jews. It's for the Palestinians. It's for the Russians. It's for every nation. This is why I cringe when I hear Christian people bad mouthing different nations because of the way that they are perhaps attacking Israel over there, the dirt over there. Well, hang on a second. Everybody has a right to be saved. So Christianity goes into all the world to preach the gospel to every creature. We don't just pick and choose. Oh, well, you know. And by the way, I, and I said this for, for those that come in later. You know, men like John Hagee who says you shouldn't even witness to the Jews because they have a special covenant with God and God is going to bring them in. Listen, that's more anti-Semitic than what it is to say, no, you persecuted Jesus, but Jesus said this. Oh, I'm sorry, I've got to go to Acts 2. Look at this here because I was reading this. Look at what look at what's said here about them. It's just incredible. And yet through their stubbornness, they still don't want to listen to the gospel. Look at Acts chapter 3. Look at verse 25. He says this. He says, Ye are the children of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying unto Abraham, And in thy seed. Now who is his seed? That was Jesus. Shall all the kindreds of the earth be blessed? Watch this. Unto you first. God, having raised up his son Jesus, sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from your iniquities. Well, what did they do with Jesus? Well, they obviously they crucified him, killed him, and said, Whoo, yeah, we got rid of that guy. He said he was the Messiah. They're still looking for a Messiah. So it's not like, oh, well, we shouldn't preach to the Palestinians because they're persecuting Israel. Listen, Israel deserves the persecution. Amen. I believe. So it's like, hey, we preach to the Jews, we preach to the Gentiles, we preach to anybody and everybody. Is everyone going to hear and receive the gospel? No, they're not. But that doesn't mean we stop preaching the gospel. Is every Jew going to, going to receive the gospel? No, but we keep preaching. Never get it into your head. This is why you've got to be careful who you listen to out there because I know a lot of independent Baptist people love listening to John Hagee because he's pro-Israel. If you listen to him, you won't witness to a Jewish person. And if you don't witness to a Jewish person and give them an opportunity to be saved, when they die, they're going to go to hell. Is that amen? Is that right? Yeah. Of course it is. All right. So we've got this, we've got this temple, uh, temple in the outer court being trodden down for 40 and two months. It's just going to be crazy. Um, it's going to be destroyed. It's just amazing what's going to take place. But let's read on anyway. Let's have a look at the holy city being Jerusalem. Now we come to the two witnesses. And he says in verse 3, he says, And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days. How many days is that, Duncan? <laughs> How many years is that, Duncan? That's right. Thank you, Duncan. Assistant Pastor Duncan here. What a blessing. So notice something about these witnesses. How long do they prophesy for? Three and a half years. So from the middle... To the end, they're prophesying, and then as, as it goes on, they're killed at the end. Everyone thinks that once the seven years is finished, it's, it's done away with. Do you know it actually keeps going on? Well, I thought it was just seven years. No. No. They're killed at the end of the seven years. They die, and then for the next three days after their uh, testimony and after their uh, preaching has been finished, they carry on dead in the streets and then they're raised up. This is after. Everyone seems to think, well, at the end of the 70th week, when that's seven years, that's done. No, no, no. It gets going on a little bit. Read it. Look at Daniel. I think it's Daniel chapter 12. It talks about 30 extra days. Is it 49 extra days, I think? So you've got 70 extra days. Now, some believe that that time is how long great tribulation is going to last. At the beginning, well, great tribulation is going to last, is it 70 days? 70 days. But then there are some who put that on at the end because the two witnesses die and they're dead in the streets for the next three and a half days. And then that's when the other 70 days are placed on at the end. Now, it's up to you what you want to believe about that, but it doesn't finish dead on the 70th 
or the seven years. It keeps continuing on. Who are the two witnesses? Someone want to give a guess? Who are the two witnesses? Oh, shut up. <laughs> uh, if you haven't worked him out already, just anyway. Some will say it's Enoch. Why would they say Enoch and Elijah? I, they didn't die, correct? That's right. Some will say it's Moses and Elijah. Why would they say Moses and Elijah? Listen, if you get it wrong, you don't fail and lose your salvation. Or I just, why would they say it's Moses and Elijah? Moses and Elijah with, with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration representing uh, uh, was it the law and the prophets, so on, all right? And then uh, obviously Elijah didn't die. Moses, well, it's special with Moses, but we see Moses. And if you look at the miracles, okay, let's have a look at these miracles. Look at this. He says, verse 3, I'll give power unto my two witnesses and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred threescore days clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. And if a man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth. Oh, man, I wish, some, I, wish I could have that. Oh, no. Come against me, I'll be like... <laughs> <laughs> Devoureth their enemies. I'm sure there have been some preachers in the past who think they could do that. And devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, then he must in this manner be killed. These, these have power to shut up heaven that it rain not... In the days of their prophecy. How long were the days of their prophecy? Three and a half years. Who was it that prayed and stopped the rain for three and a half years? Elijah. Elijah James chapter 5. All right. Who was it that called fire down from heaven? Elijah. All right. I think it's Elijah, but you can, you can say it's Enoch if you want. These have power to shut heaven that it rain in the days of their prophecy and have power over waters to turn them to blood. What? Uh, let's go back into Egypt for a moment. Remember, remember Moses? What did he do with the water? Turned it into blood. All right. And smite the earth with all the plagues. That happened back in Genesis, all right? Uh, back in Exodus. As often as they will. All right. So I put now, again, it's like it doesn't actually say who it is. I personally think that this is Moses and that's Elijah. All right. If you think it's Enoch, hey, God bless you. Like Cameron said, it may be two totally different people that we weren't even expecting. Either way, these two witnesses preach or prophesy for three and a half years. Listen, in a time where it's like, now listen to, listen to the, just the grace and mercy of God, that he even sent prophets during the darkest hours of this world to preach under them and people still didn't listen. As a matter of fact, they killed him. Why? Well, have a look at what it says in chapter, uh, verse number 10. They that dwell on the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry and shall send gifts one to another. It's going to be, it's going to be a public holiday. It's going to be called killing the prophet's holiday. Everyone sends out gifts. Well, we killed them. Why? Because these two prophets tormented them that dwell on the earth. That's why they killed him, because they tormented by what they were saying, what they were prophesying. Is it any different today? This is why the, this is why the pulpits of Australia need, need men in there that will just preach the word. I'm not saying harshly, I'm not, because I don't believe in... You don't have to be harsh to get a truth across. You just have to be confident that what you're preaching is from God. And that you've searched the scriptures and the spirit of God is getting. And, and the other thing is this. What did, I think it was God told Jeremiah, don't look at their faces. Now, I like to walk around and look at you because if you're falling asleep, I'd like to, you know, help you out with that, you know. <laughs> but here, I, you know what? You, you preach regardless of how people look in the pew. Wouldn't it be good, Brother Michael, if we could get a picture one day when you're song leading or preaching and just have a look at the faces of the people? You know, sometimes, brethren, you get up here to start the song service and everyone's like, you know, be draggled and, you know, it's almost like, I dare you to wake me up and I dare you to get me excited for Jesus. You know what I mean? And I get the fact that everybody has a hard week, has a hard day. I get that. But, brethren, sometimes when you stand up here and you look at the faces of people, you think, what in the world? <laughs> Again, I understand. People go through stuff. I get it. All right. I get it. But. 
It's like you don't look at their face, especially if you're going to preach messages that God's given you. If you guys, any of you men get called to preach, you need to stand up here and preach, thus saith the Lord, whether people are going to receive it and be happy about it or not. It's a message from God. And the preacher needs to please the Lord more than people. Okay? So they were cured because they tormented. They to- and by the way, you know, this, this preacher again out there by the, uh, uh, the, the Joseph Princes of the world and the Joel Osteens and, you know, all this other stuff like the, the health and wealthy crowd like Kenneth Copeland and all that crowd. If you notice anything about their prophecy, so-called prophecies, they're all like... Uh, uh, nice and, you know, sugar-coated stuff and all that's so sweet and all this. Listen, when the prophets got up to prophesy, they didn't preach any sh- candy sticks, you know what I mean? It was just bang, thus saith the Lord. They preached it and people got upset about it. Now, notice something about these two prophets. Notice something. They are, they're called the two olive trees. Now, you can go back to Zechariah chapter 4 and have a look at that. But the two olive trees, let me just say something about olive trees produce olives. How's that? I went to Bible college to learn that. (laughs) Olive trees produce olives which produce oil and it's for anointing. So you look at these two witnesses, they are anointed of God. All right. And then it says they're candlesticks. Now what does a candlestick do? It gives off light. All right. So they were light in a very dark and desperate time. Is the church meant to be a candlestick? Yes. yes, we see that at the beginning of Revelation where the, the seven candlesticks of the seven churches, this church, this church, can't say anything about any other church, this church ought to be a candlestick, it ought to let the light shine. Now two things happen when you let the light shine. You attract people and you attract bugs. Am I right? <laughs> I'm, hey, listen, you can't have one without the other. Let me put it to you in a more spiritual term. According to Matthew 13, you have the wheat and the tares. <laughs> All right? But you know, you got like uh, probably where you guys live. If you live anywhere that's sort of semi rural, like maybe where Clive and Kim live or whatever it is, you know, you put the light on the back. What does that attract? And then you've got to get the mozzie thing out there and you hear it zapping all night and carrying on. Why is that? Because the light is... And that's the thing that we've got to be careful about, church, is that when God blesses and God is adding, what also comes along with that are are the, the undesirable element to that. Because Satan wants to destroy that which God does. He can't create. Amen? Satan can't create, but he's a counterfeiter. And so therefore, you've got to, this is why we've got to know this. This is why you all have to know this. Not just the pastor, but everybody's got to know the Bible because when there's false brethren or false people come in, how are we going to judge whether they're false? By the Word of God. By the Word of God. And so therefore, we as a church are experiencing a, 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 a green patch, if you please, where God has been adding... But I've said this to a few folks. I I don't have the luxury of just bathing in that because I know what the enemy wants to do. He wants to blindside and bang and all this and upset the apple cart. Anyway, I might preach more about that later on in the main service. Now, let's have a look at this. Look at verse 7. And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast. Now, watch this. The beast... 10 o'clock, 10.07. The beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overthrow them and kill them. Their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Where was that? Jerusalem. Notice the wording that the Lord gives for Jerusalem. Spiritually, you're Sodom. Spiritually, you're Egypt. Think about that. Now, we don't have time. I think I've got, I've got scriptures there. I've just departed from the notes. I don't even know why I've got it open. But you've got scriptures there that you can have a look at, that you go back and you see, okay, Let's go to, okay, let's go to Ezekiel for a minute. How long? I've got, I've got a few minutes. Let's go to Ezekiel for a second. We're going to, I want to talk about that beast that, that comes up out of the pit. We go to Ezekiel 16. Because Sodom wasn't just known, according to Jude, verse 7, for going after strange flesh. We all understand, don't we, what that means, right? I don't have to elaborate on that with 
young people around. We know about Sodom, don't we? All right. So understand something, what, what God is saying about Jerusalem. You're going after strange faith, but he's talking spiritually now. So in other words, Jerusalem, Jerusalem is going to bed with other nations, other religions. Okay? But have a look at this, because strange flesh isn't just something that Sodom was known for. Look at verse number, uh, where are we, 49? Uh, sorry, Ezekiel 16. Look at verse 48. As I live, saith the Lord God, Sodom thy sister hath not, uh, hath not done, she nor her daughters as thou hast done, thou and thy daughters. Behold, this was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom, pride, fullness of bread or uh, uh, excess and abundance of idleness was in her and in her daughters neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and the needy and they were haughty and committed abomination before me therefore I took them away as I saw good so notice something about Sodom and that now they were uh, they were pri they were pri prideful they had excess of stuff abundance of idleness they were haughty this is Jerusalem do we not see that even in the news today where they're all getting, oh, you can't touch us if you say anything about us, if you do da, 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 all that sort of... That's pride. And it's only going to be fed more and more into that with all the other nations of the world jumping into bed with Jerusalem. Okay? So, so don't be... Don't get... Like, people get so upset. Oh, you shouldn't say this about Jerusalem. Well, hang on a second. We're not. God's already said it. God's already said what they're like. And he goes on further later on in the book of Revelation, calling her a great whore. So, who is this beast that rises up and kills these two prophets? Just says that it's a beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit. Very quickly, go to chapter 13, Revelation 13. Because there, there's two beasts. And uh, you've got heads over these beasts. All right. Now, when you use the term beast, it doesn't really conjure up anything cuddly. It's just, you know what I mean? Like when you think about a beast, you think about something that's nasty, that's got, you know, just wants to kill and tear and all this sort of stuff. So notice the first beast that rises up. And I stood, verse 1, 13, 1, and I stood upon the sand of the sea and I saw a beast rise up out of the sea having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his head the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and he goes on, and that's the different kinds of nations. We see those animals mentioned back in Daniel's day. And then verse 3, it says, One of the heads was wounded unto death, and it was healed, and I believe that was the Antichrist, and he's either, he's either miraculously raised from the dead, or it's a bit of a you know story sort of thing. But anyway, they worship, verse 4, they worshipped the dragon which gave power unto the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? Um, power was given unto him. Verse 7, It was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, and power was given unto them, all kindreds. That's, that's the midpoint, by the way. Uh, and he goes on. Look at verse number 11. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth. So where the, the, when you talk about the bottomless pit or you talk about hell or anything like that, where is it predominantly known as? It's, it's where? It's the centre of the earth type of thing, right? So you have these two beasts. You have a beast that comes up out of the sea and you've got a beast that comes up out of the earth. The first beast is the, is the political one, the one world government, one world economy, all of that. And then the second beast that rises up is that one world religion over which the false prophet presides over. So when you think about these two prophets that are killed, if we go back here and it says this beast arises up out of the pit and makes war with them and shall overcome them and kill them, I believe it's the polit uh, not the political, I believe it's the religious beast that rise up because these prophets are prophesying things against them. Yes, it's against the political system. Of that there is no doubt. But when you look at today, even in today's religious economy, those of us who are... Um, Separate, you know what I mean by that? When we, when, this is the importance about separation now, and it's a whole, whole doctrine all of itself. To remain separate from religious institutions that are corrupt. 
Because if you don't remain separate from religious institutions, the corruption will corrupt us. So it's not, it's not, separation is not a, um, a nasty thing, it's one of protection. So you've got these two witnesses that are now prophesying what God tells them and up out of, out of this bottomless pit, this beast kills them. To me, it would be the religious system of the day that kills them because they're going against what is actually being preached by the state or government uh, religion. Like, you know, in, in Russia, you've got the state-run religions and all of that. So the, the religious beast is... And who is going to attack Christianity more? Is it going to be the Australian government or is it going to be the religious institutions of the day? I would say it's going to be the religious institutions because we're not towing the party line. We're remaining strong with our Bible. We love our Bible. We're going to preach, thus saith the Lord. We're going to preach that, uh, that, that yes, the, the Jewish nation did kill Jesus and, and we're going to say he was he dead, he was buried, he rose again and, and that the only, way to, uh, the only way to the Father is through Jesus Christ. And we already see that people don't like that, right? They don't like, they want to hear that. Well, you've got, and by the way, can I just say this? Be careful of celebrity conversions. Yes. Yes. There's, there's a lot out there now who are, and again, I'm, not, I'm, I'm just, I'm cautious. Is that okay? Yes. I'm just cautious about, hey, Jordan Peterson, hey, I like listening to Jordan Peterson. I think he's got a lot of great things to say, but I'm cautious about his testimony with, with salvation. I love Russell Brand. I think what he's got, I like what he's got to say because he goes against, you know what I mean? And if you, if you like that sort of stuff. But again, I'm very cautious about his Christianity. I'm not saying he's not. I'm, just, I'm, just, I'm not just jumping in boots and all and saying, oh, bless God, all these celebrities are getting saved. Hallelujah. Because what happened to Kanye West? Oh, I'm saved. Woo. No, whoa. R- really? Isn't Christianity about change? Right, and you're still singing these songs and doing all this stuff. Really, sorry. So I'm just what I'm saying is just be careful, just be cautious. Don't get all wrapped up and enamoured with all those people and others. And anyway, we didn't get to the millennium. Maybe maybe next time we pick it up, we'll get to the we'll get to the millennium. All right. I say a word of prayer. Father, we love you. We thank you for your goodness and blessing to us. Help us. Lord, to understand these things, study it for ourselves. And again, Lord, we just pray you'll lead us and guide us into all truth. Bless our fellowship time now in Jesus' name. Amen.